In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, Jesus has severely rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. And he informs them that they had been doing the exact same things that their forefathers had done in relationship to the prophets that had been sent to them. He gives a plaintive cry in verse 37 of that chapter. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth their chickens under her wing, and ye would not. As a result of that, the next verse tells them that their house, their house, not God's house now, would be left unto them desolate. In verse 20, or chapter 24 then, Jesus goes out and his disciples show him all of the buildings of the temple. And he tells his disciples, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. We're going to see the fulfillment of that in the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and the Roman armies in A.D. 70. But his, uh, some of his disciples come to him and ask him, Well, when shall this take place? What shall be the signs of thy coming? and the end of the world. And Jesus, beginning at that point, goes on to reveal unto them the signs that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem, where one stone would not be left upon another. And that continues on through verse 35. In verse 36, we see a strong con- uh, well, it disjoins from the other, a strong contrast being made. When he says, he uses the word but. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. While there would be signs that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem, when it comes to the end of the world, there is not going to be any signs. No one knows when it's going to take place. And from, from this point on through the end of chapter 25, he thus then gives some information regarding that second coming of Christ and the literal end of the world where this world will be destroyed and will be no more. He gives a series of parables to explain how we should act and while we are waiting for his return. There's the parable of the servant in verses 45 through verse 51 in which a wicked servant in this case was lost for his own sinful conduct. <clears throat> then in chapter 25 as we continue into chapter 25 the first 13 verses gives us the parable of the ten virgins five wise virgins who had made proper preparation for the coming of the bridegroom, and five foolish virgins who, while making preparation, did not make the proper preparation. And thus we learn that we must prepare properly and we must always be ready. That brings us to the parable of the talents, which we've been looking at the past couple of weeks. Starting in verse 14 and going through verse 30. Jesus had told them to watch and pray for his return. Here's the previous parable of the ten virgins who were just watching, who were just waiting for the bridegroom to come. To prevent the conclusion that some no doubt would want to have and would conclude that all we have to do is to sit and wait and watch for the sky for the Lord to come. We don't have to do anything. 
Well, thus Jesus gives this parable, that it's not enough to simply watch and wait. We must be busy in the master's service. In this parable, the two parables are called kingdom parables because they discuss what the kingdom is <coughs> and what the kingdom is going to be like. It's called the church is called in this the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of Christ, God's dear son. It's the kingdom of heaven. Not that they are different kingdoms, but that the, it expresses different ideas. The kingdom belongs to God. He has been appointed his son to rule and reign over that kingdom. And the kingdom of heaven, because that's where the king rules. He rules in heaven. The... <clears throat> Our Christians are not waiting for a kingdom to come, but they are waiting for the Lord to come and take his citizens of his kingdom to a heavenly eternity. But now then, in this parable, there is a householder. He is traveling to a far country, another country. He goes there to receive that kingdom. Our Lord went to a, another country, if I can use that terminology. He went to heaven to sit at God's right hand and to reign as king over his kingdom. In Acts, the second chapter, as Peter is preaching his sermon, he first discounts the very brief uh, objection of some that these men are simply drunk. Well, no, it's, we're not, because it's only the third hour of the day, or nine o'clock in the morning. But, he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel's prophecy. And this is the fulfillment of that. And he concludes that prophecy in verse 21 by stating, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered or shall be saved. We have a lot of in the denominational world who says, All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord. Well, that's true in a sense, not the way in which they use it. But from a biblical standpoint, that is true. You have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. They mean simply an audible calling where we say, Lord, Lord, or Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. And Well, that's not what is spoken of. If you want to see what calling on the name of the Lord really is, you look at verse 38. When in verse 37, they asked men, brethren, what shall we do? And they were told to repent and be baptized. That's what calling on the name of the Lord is. It's not an audible calling. It is an action whereby they repent and are baptized. But from this beginning of, after quoting Joel's prophecy, he then directs their attention to Jesus of Nazareth and that how God had appointed him to be king, that he is one that was approved of God by the miracles which he performed. In their presence, they knew about the miracles. But God had determined that he would die for the sins of the world but that his body would not be left in the grave. He would be raised from the dead. The pains of death would be loosed. And because it, he says it's not possible that the pains of death could hold him. That really becomes the explanation to a great extent of what Jesus says. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
what he's talking about in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, or Hades, literally, is that he's going into the Hadean world, but it wouldn't have power over him. That pain of death would be loosed, he would be raised from the dead, and he would establish the church. That's what he's talking about. It's dealing with his resurrection and thus establishing the church. Why? Because the pains of death could not hold him. He mentions David's prophecies, how that he's going to raise up one to sit on his throne. That's David's throne. That's God's throne. And the idea of being raised up was one who was raised from the dead and thus ascended into heaven. It wasn't David himself because David, Peter said, he's still in the grave. But this Jesus was raised from the dead. His sepulcher, Peter says, is with us to this day. But he was a prophet, David was, and God had sworn to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He goes into heaven to sit on the throne of God. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, we see this same principle being taught. And <coughs> go back uh, to verse 7, actually. We won't notice in particular verses 8 through 10. But verse 7 begins by saying, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Let me just mention that this is dealing with miraculous powers. And the grace there and the gift that is being spoken of are the miraculous powers that Christ is going to give to some individuals. It was given to the apostles as they were baptized of the Holy Spirit. The apostles then had the power to pass that miraculous powers on to someone else by the laying on of their hands. Well, when would this take place? Verse 8, Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that, he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up to far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Christ ascended up into heaven. Why? To rule and to reign That's the time frame, and it also to, um, he led captivity captive. The idea is that he is forgiving people of their sins during this time frame. In heaven, he serves as our great priest, as well as king, ruling and reigning on his throne. During that period of time when he has ascended into heaven, He's going to give gifts unto men. The giving gifts would be the miraculous powers. But then he also mentioned the one that ascended, Christ, now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth so that he could ascend far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Christ left heaven's home to come to this earth. He descended to this earth to save man from their sins, to lead captivity captive by his death upon the cross, and then being able to take that blood into heaven itself to offer his blood as a sacrifice for our sins as he sit, would sit and rule upon the throne. 
And thus he is now sitting at God's right hand. But one day he's going to return in the clouds. In Acts the first chapter in verse 11, as Jesus has ascended or has been raised from the dead, he's now with his apostles, he's giving them one of the times in which the Great Commission is revealed unto them. And he promises them, the apostles, that baptism of the Holy Spirit and tells them that they are to be witnesses unto him both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's Acts 1 and verse 8. As he was speaking those things, he is taken up in a cloud out of their sight into heaven. Two angels, they're standing there, the apostles looking at him, watching him return into heaven. And two angels appear to them, and in verse 11, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. There's going to come a time in which he's going to return. Not going to be to set foot on this earth, not to establish a kingdom because he's king over his kingdom now. But he's going to return and it's going to be in the clouds. It's going to be a visible coming. In fact, Revelation 1 and verse 7 states, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I realize that some of our brethren take this verse and apply it to the destruction of Jerusalem. How did every eye see the destruction of Jerusalem? doesn't fit what is stated by John here in Revelation 1 and verse 7. From a worldwide standpoint, the destruction of Jerusalem was something that was very minor. We talk about it a great deal, but it was something minor back then. I mean, to those people who were living at that time, it's hardly a blip on the radar, as we would express it. But here's something where every eye in the entire world will see our Lord coming in the clouds. Every eye seeing Him. How is that going to work out? I don't know. You mean people in, on the opposite side of the world are going to see Him at the same time that I do? Yes. How? I don't know. I'm not concerned about it. I know what it states. Every eye shall see. He's going to come visibly. As he went up into heaven, they saw him go up into heaven, so he will come visibly. That shows that these invisible comings that some people claim, they never took place. These dreams that some of these modern-day miracle workers have of Jesus appearing to them, uh, well, no, didn't happen. They might have been having a dream. It might have been even a nightmare to some of them, but uh, it wasn't our Lord coming because every eye will see him at that time. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17, it says that then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. He has just told them those who had died from this, in this world while they were Christians, while they were faithfully serving God, that they would be raised before these individuals who are now living when Christ comes those are going to be raised 
an immortal body, an incorruptible body. They're going to meet their spirits in the air. And then we which are alive, those who are still alive at the time when Christ comes, they're going to be caught up. Now, it's interesting how that the premillennialists want to use this language of some rapture into heaven. Well, again, it doesn't quite fit the rapture theory when you look at what is being stated. They're going to be caught up together with them, those saints who have departed this world and are now being reunited with their spirits. And that is a way in which we will ever be with the Lord. Jesus was preparing in these parables his apostles for his departure. His departure was going to be in just a few days. It wasn't long off. But also he expresses in this that it was going to be, he was going to come again but he was going to be gone a long time. Look at Matthew 25 and verse 19 in particular. When it says, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with him them. Some have been through the years uh, claiming that Jesus was supposedly teaching an immediate return. And they also set forth that the apostles were teaching the immediate return of our Lord. But yet the Lord here is teaching, I'm going away for a long time. Not an immediate return. Now, yes, we should be ready and prepared for his return at any time because he could come at any time. We should always be living as if the second coming could happen any second. Now, if we live that way, how many times will it help us to overcome sin within our life? When we're being tempted to sin, if we will just think within our minds, what if Christ comes at that time? Does he want to find me Committing this sin. So the master is going into a far country. He's going to go into heaven itself. But he calls his servants and he delivers them his goods. What we have here is the principle of stewardship. We need to recognize that God owns everything. Even us, our lives, our time, our talents our material goods, our very lives itself. God owns everything. He owns everything by right of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created us. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. God created man. He owns man. Owns all of the world. The psalmist would put it in the 24th Psalm in verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. All of it belongs to Him. In the 50th Psalm, verse 11, uh, 10 and verse 11, God is saying, For every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle upon a, th a thousand hills, I know all of the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. God is claiming ownership of everything. We don't, from that standpoint, own anything. It all belongs to God. We are simply to use God's possessions properly. That's called, <coughs> that's called stewardship. 
where the steward recognizes that these things belong to the owner, but he is using them for the owner's benefit. Paul would say it in relationship, and I realize the prince, or Paul is using it in specifically dealing with preaching the gospel, but it has a far wider application when in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, he says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. There must be a faithfulness on the part of those who are stewards. We are stewards of all this world that God owns. We are stewards of our physical bodies which God owns. In 1 Peter in the 4th chapter in verse 10, every man as, as he hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now I realize again, this is within the context of the miraculous. And when he talks about it, as every man hath received the gift, he talking about miraculous gifts, miraculous powers there. Those who had received those miraculous powers, they had to use those as good stewards of that which God had blessed them with. It carries a far greater application, though, than just those individuals who had miraculous powers to each and every individual. God has given unto us by His grace, by His love and care, the ability to use certain things within this world. Our bodies included. We have to make sure that we are faithful in relationship to how we use them. And that, regard, that regards everything within this world everything that we come in contact with, everything that we own is to be used for God's glory and God's praise. And because we're stewards of that which God owns, we're going to have to give an account for how we use that which He has placed under our care. In Romans 14th chapter and verse 12, Paul would write, so then every one of us must give an account of himself to God. I'm going to be called before the throne of God, the throne of Christ. And I'm going to be, have to give an account for that which God has blessed me with, God, what God has given me and whether or not I have been faithful in my stewardship of that which God has given me. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Just as I will have to stand before Christ and give an account of how I have been a steward of that which he owns, so you will have to stand before Christ and give an account of that which he has given to you and blessed you with. And whether or not you have used those things to his glory and praise, you've been a good steward of that which he has given unto you, or whether you've been evil, you've been bad, good or bad, we're going to give an account. And if we have failed to use those things in the way in which God wants us to use them, if we have failed to be good stewards of that which God owns, then we will hear those words, depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If, on the other hand, we have been faithful in that stewardship, of what God owns, we will be able to hear those good words, enter into the joys of thy Lord. Enter into heaven's home where you will be able to spend an eternity with him. If you're not a Christian this morning, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ that upon your faith 
repent of your sins, make that confession of your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what they were told to do on that day of Pentecost as Peter proclaimed the kingship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that that's what they had to do, the same thing that we must do in order to be saved from our sins. If you have not been a faithful steward of God's gifts to you in your life, then why not, as a child of God, repent of your sins, let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them, and begin being a faithful steward of God's possessions. If we can help you in this, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.